We're going to be palpating the ulna. So one of the two forearm bones, we have the radius in this area and we have the ulna, technically the more medial, but because of the position I'm in, it looks like it's closer to me. So the first item I'm going to kind of point out right in this area is our olecranon, which is the most proximal part of the ulna. It's a really easy bony landmark for you to feel. Uh, it's where we rest a lot. So if you were just to place your elbow onto the table, you'd be pushing onto the olecranon and is the main insertion of our triceps muscle. So I'm gonna ask my partner to do is to push out in this direction with their forearm. Go ahead and push out into me, good. She's activating her triceps and the triceps tendon is coming down and inserting right here into the olecranon process of the ulna. So that should be a really easy item for you to be able to palpate. Just make sure you can distinguish it from the medial and lateral epicondyles of the humerus and they go central to that for the olecranon. As the person goes into a full extension, again, it's gonna be quite easy to see this bony object with two indentations on either side. And as I go into flexion, it should definitely start to stick out. What's unique about the ulna is it actually kind of separates your extensors from your flexors. So I like this view right here, just with the arm relaxed in a pronated position, but I can basically go from the olecranon all the way down the shaft of the ulna to the distal end known as its head. So this makes it a really easy bone to be able to identify in the forearm. Now I'm gonna be taking a look at an anterior proximal bony landmark next. So I'm gonna be turning the arm palm up and we're gonna be coming in and trying to find what is known as the coronoid and then getting a little bit deep in the approximate area of the ulnar tuberosity. Now, if you've already watched the radius video, um, we had the biceps brachii tendon going down towards the radius but underneath biceps brachii is a muscle known as brachialis. And brachialis is going to be going in and inserting onto the ulna. So I'm going to ask for a supinated elbow flexion for a moment. Go ahead and push up into my hand here. Good. So I have this biceps tendon, the distal tendon of it. And I'm going to drop off medially and try to go underneath a little bit. And again, pull for me. Perfect. And so this is brachialis. So I'm on the humerus for a portion of brachialis. And I'm now going to round what I call round the corner, go from humerus to ulna. And then I want to passively flex this elbow and try to sink in here. The muscle you're probably going to come across next is pronator teres, which I have currently in my fingers. Um, and this also has an attachment on this coronoid process of the ulna. So what I'm going to try to do, and again, this is quite deep, is I'm going to hook my finger to the proximal side of pronator teres and sink down as far as I can towards the ulna. Now, very gently, if I can have you flex your elbow for me, you, bring your palm to your face, good. And can you turn your palm into a pronated position by turning? Excellent. So I've used both brachialis's flexion of the elbow as well as pronator teres is pronation. And if you wanted to add one more muscle to that list, this is flexor digitorum superficialis. So if you wanted to start closing your hand to make a fist for me, Good. We can start to feel three kind of muscle tissues from different locations from above and below and deep, all in that coronoid area. Just distal to the coronoid process, I'm not going to be able to feel it, is what is known as the ulnar tuberosity. And that is the main attachment for our brachialis, but you're not going to be able to feel that roughened surface because it's underneath too much musculature. Okay, so the ulna running down the medial forearm as we get all the way towards the distal end. I'm actually gonna turn the forearm back over and place it in a pronated position, palm down, because the head of the ulna, with the distal attachment, is easier seen from a pronate position. Without any effort whatsoever, I can look across the ulna and see a large bony object that's sticking up. If we passively flex the wrist, and held it up, again, the head of the ulna is an easy find for us. So right in here, because it's the whole distal end, I'm trying to grab both the proximal 
dorsal surface and palmar surface of it, and I can use a pincher grasp for it. I'm gonna lift this up a little bit. I can start to do a little bit of pronation and supination. It shouldn't move. I can use some ulnar and radial deviation. It doesn't move because the ulna is always constant. The radius is what's doing supination and pronation. So as long as I'm not moving the ulna through flexion extension, this should be a pretty stable landmark. The head is quite large, so it's easier for you to feel. But the next bony landmark we're gonna look off of it is called the styloid process. So for this, I'm gonna put the palm back down. And the styloid process of the radius was here on what you would call almost the most lateral part of the forearm. And the styloid process of the ulna is in the exact opposite position, but more on the exact and more medial part. So here is the head, but as I roll off the head, heading towards the most medial aspect, anatomically medial, I'm gonna come across a projection that's sticking out right in here. So this is our styloid process of the ulna. Again, I can use some radial ulnar deviation of the hand and it is not moving. Just like the radial styloid, it is a ligamentous attachment and the same thing goes for this. There's one other helpful cue to help you try to find where that styloid is. If the person does an extension ulnar deviation and holds their arm up. I'm gonna add a little resistance. Extension and ulnar deviation. There's a muscle and a tendon right here known as extensor carpi ulnaris. It actually goes through a small groove between the head and the styloid process. So I have the head here, I have extensor carpi ulnaris there, and then I have the styloid. So once she relaxes again, the tendon will drop down, but the bony object, the styloid, will remain underneath it. So that is a, a secondary helpful cue to make sure you're in the right location. So there's not a lot of landmarks from in the ulna. We have our olecranon at one end and we have the head at the other, but for the most part, the entire middle part is mainly shaft. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna bring up one more bony landmark. This is not gonna be an easy find, but it might help for some of you finding a muscle known as supinator a little bit later. Um, this landmark is known as supinator's crest. It is again, not a landmark you can easily feel, um, but I'm gonna point it out anyways. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna position the arm so that I can access the head of the radius. So here being the head sitting inside the radial notch of the ulna, I'm gonna approach the ulna by dropping off the radial head towards the ulna. And this is now in between the ulna and the radius. And I'm gonna go slightly distal to the head of the radius. I'm gonna put your arm down. So as a landmarking, this is the head of the radius. This is the olecranon and the shaft of the ulna and I wanna go in between them, and this would be the approximate area of the supinator's crest. If you can just start to turn your palm up for me by rotating it out, good, that is supination, and put it back down and do that one more time. This would be the activation of the muscle supinator. You're not gonna feel a bony landmark, but it is quite deep. You can see I put a couple little nail marks in there because I'm really trying to sink in between those two bones. Okay, I believe that is all the bony landmarks that we're gonna discuss of the ulna today.